Uh, my name is Jesse Davis, and I work for Tengen. <laughs> uh, and this talk is called Async. What is it? How does it work? And when should I use it? Um, right. And if you want to talk about MongoDB with us, um, come see us in room 301 at 7 tonight. Uh, but this talk is going to be about async. And it's going to be in Python, but it's not actually particularly Python specific. I'm going to use Tornado, which is a fairly simple and extremely popular Python async framework as my um, sort of sample async framework, but Tornado works very, very much like Node and similarly to a bunch of other async frameworks that are out there. So you'll know async by the end of this talk. You'll get how it works and the rest is going to be largely details and syntax. Um, the order of this is actually going to be when should I use it, uh, what is it and how does it work. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's because I forgot to use a mutex. So to begin, this is a classic example of the sort of web service that doesn't need to be async. In fact, it doesn't even really need to be concurrent. If you're only using the CPU to respond to client requests, then you don't really need any concurrency at all because you're never waiting for anything. So uh, memcached or varnish are good examples of this. They serve requests from memory. Or if you had some web service that like calculated a large uh, prime number in response to every client request, then all it should do is you should run one process per core. Uh, you receive client requests as fast as you can, answer each one completely, and then accept the next connection. So there's no need for any concurrency here, and there's definitely no need for async. But uh, most web services aren't anything like this. Most of them have to do some sort of I.O. in between accepting the client request and completing the response to the client. Um, and that additional I.O. can be all sorts of things. It can be file I.O., uh, it, which isn't actually very well supported by almost any async framework. So we're just going to pretend that I didn't say that for the rest of the talk. Um, and I.O. over sockets, which is very well supported and by far the common case. So you're doing um, usually a request to a database, but it could be uh, anything else that's available over the network. So you might receive a request and you need to validate the authentication token with Facebook before you can proceed and respond. And that kind of um, delegated authentication is a great example of something that you really need async for because that's at the other end of a long, fat pipe. It's long in the sense that when you send a request, it takes a long time to come back, but it's fat in the sense that its throughput is as big as you need it to be. So you're not going to overwhelm Facebook with authentication validation requests, but it's not going to be very fast either. And so you're going to spend most of your time, if you have an architecture like that, waiting for the other end to get back to you so that you can then finish your response to the client. And uh, in this case, you're not using very much CPU per client because nothing's happening. You're just waiting for something else to happen somewhere else in the world so you can get back to the original client request. And in this case, you're typically memory bound rather than CPU bound you are bound by the overhead of holding connections open while you're waiting uh, to be ready to finish the request to the client. Um, and in this case then, the trick is not to be faster, but to hold connections open more efficiently. And uh, this is even more true, well, so one of the, um, one of the trends that is making this more important is um, service-oriented architecture. So it's becoming more and more common that you might need to talk to a server on the other side of the world in order to finish a request locally. Uh, and then the other, of course, is web sockets. Um, in the olden days, you could rely on somebody to visit your site. 
download all the stuff from your site, and then you close your connections. Nowadays, more and more frequently, somebody visits your site, downloads some JavaScript, which connects to you and holds that connection open indefinitely. Uh, this could either be actual web sockets, or it could be um, long polling, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, but which also has this characteristic that everybody who visits your site holds a connection open indefinitely. And so the number of connections you've got open to your server at any moment goes from being, you know, a thousand might be a large number for a static site to having 10,000 or 100,000 being a completely reasonable number uh, for a dynamic site that uses WebSockets. So this is what async is designed for. Um, we're trying to minimize the overhead per connection so that we can hold open more idle connections per server. And uh, so I promised I'd talk about long polling. Um, and this is going to be the async application that we'll focus on for this talk. Uh, do people already know what long polling is, or do I need to explain it? All right, raise your hands if you want it explained. OK, about half the room. Fine. Um, so a typical AJAX request, you ask for something with JavaScript, and the server responds as fast as possible and closes the connection. So if you have a page that needs to update itself when something happens on the server, then you would write some JavaScript which asks the server like once a second, is there anything new for me? Is there anything new? Is there anything new? Um, and the server would typically say no and close the connection. And then every once in a while it says yes and closes the connection. Um, and this is CPU bound. If your server can answer, is there anything new, a thousand times per second, then you could have a thousand clients all asking once per second, is there anything new? If you have 10,000 clients, then they could each ask once every 10 seconds. And so your site starts to become, it starts to feel less live. If you had 100,000 clients, each could only ask, is there anything new, once every 100 seconds. And you rapidly become much, much less real-time. So there's a trade-off between uh, the amount of load you're willing to handle and the latency that your clients are willing to experience. Long polling, on the other hand, uh, a piece of JavaScript asks, is there anything new? And the server, if there is nothing new, doesn't respond at all. It holds the connection open and does not reply. It waits for something to happen on the server, a new tweet from somebody you follow, a new chat message in the room you've joined, happens on the server, and then the server writes that message to your socket and closes the connection so that on the JavaScript side, it knows that the message is complete, parses it, and updates the UI. Um, in this case, there's no trade-off between uh, latency and load. There's no additional load at all on the CPU because nothing's happening most of the time. Everybody's just holding open connections and nothing's passing over them. Rather, there's a trade-off, well, there's no trade-off. You need a lot of memory. And so what async does in this case is it lowers the memory requirement per connection. Make sense? You might some, sometimes hear this called Comet because Ajax is a cleaner and uh, somebody tried to um, coin Comet as the term for HTTP long polling because Comet is also a cleaner. Uh, I think that WebSockets actually became so rapidly adopted that Comet didn't have a chance to take off, and I think that the term is dead. Um, when you have architectures like this, your connection count is going to rise over what used to be considered normal numbers. So that was considered the 10,000 connection problem, C10K. Um, and this paper is an oldie but a goodie. And it, uh, it talks in great detail about um, these uh, CPU versus memory kind of dynamics. Uh, so I recommend that you read that if you're interested. And um, Tornado, which we're going to talk about today, was invented to solve this problem. It was invented by FriendFeed, which was a web page you could go to. It would listen for events in your social networks and then merge them together and update your web browser when something happened. So it was sort of an early precursor to the kind of live pages that we're used to today. 
and they wanted something that could handle the sort of connection load that that architecture caused, and they wanted it to be in a nice language, so they wrote Tornado in Python. Um, so if async is so great, then why doesn't everybody just use it already? Um, and the answer is that it's hard. So what makes it hard is that you need some way to remember what you were going to do when the event happens that says you're ready to do something. Um, so am I standing in the way of the slides for some people? Oh, all right. I'll get rid of the chair. So if you have a lot of clients who have started requests for you and you're waiting for the information in order to be able to respond to them all, then you need to be concurrent. And that means you need to be able to yield to some sort of scheduler that will resume you when you're ready to proceed. And you need to remember what you were going to do when that yield from the scheduler resumes you. And so you need to store state. Um, <clears throat> so in this example, if you're initiating a SQL query and uh, then you need to wait for that to come back to you, you need to remember what you're going to do with that query. Um, and if, you're, if you've got like a WebSocket application, then you register as an event listener to some source of events and that it notifies you that things have happened and you need to remember why you registered for them in the first place. So there's a couple of ways to remember what you were going to do to store state. Uh, one of them is threads, of course. A thread yields to the scheduler when it blocks. And when it's resumed, you don't have to do anything special to remember what you were going to do. Threads state is restored when they are resumed. And this is handled for you by the operating system and by your programming language's runtime. Um, so you take a 200 level CS class and you learn how that works and then you forget all about it for the rest of your life because your programming language deals with it for you. Um, but threads are relatively inefficient. They have stacks measured in megabytes. They take up room in scheduling structures within the operating system. Um, the scheduler in the OS has to think about your thread every time it's um, going through its loop. Callbacks are relatively cheap, so you can have lots more pending callbacks in your system than threads. But they don't have all of this great automatic stuff for you. When a callback resumes after yield to the scheduler, it needs to go find its state. And we're going to go see uh, how it does that and why that's sort of crummy. Um, but being more efficient, uh, if you have, so if you want an architecture where you have a thread per connection, programming it is going to be relatively easy. But because of threads overhead, if you have a one-to-one -one relationship between threads and connections, you'll run out of threads first. Threads will be your bottleneck. You can have a system with hundreds of threads, possibly thousands of threads, but tens of thousands of threads, hundreds of thousands of threads, you're exceeding what modern operating systems and machines can, can well support. Um, whereas having tens or hundreds of thousands of connections is becoming increasingly feasible. Um, you can disable all of the U limits and Linux essentially has no limit on the number of connections that it can hold open. So you need some cheaper way than threads to manage your per connection state. Um, threads and callbacks aren't the only ways to do this. Uh, we've got coroutines built into um, Python and some other languages. Coroutines are landing now, kind of as we're talking in JavaScript. Um, greenlets are a Python extension that gevent is based on. Uh, fibers are the same idea for V8, um, and, and so on and so on. Uh, I think the fact that there's so much churn in this area of like good ways to um, store state per connection and to manage highly, highly concurrent I.O. limited applications means that like there's pain here, and we haven't totally figured it out. Everybody's got their trade-offs between 
this is a little easier versus this is a little more efficient. And no one of those trade-offs satisfies everybody. And so every year we have like a few more ideas that are being thrown out there. Um, promises, node.async, queue, all of these different things. Everybody's kind of trying to figure out, you know, if I, if I get a little more ease in exchange for a little bit of efficiency, is that better for some people or not? So let's finally look at some code. Um, Oh, so first of all, here's the dumbest demo in the history probably of Open Source Bridge. Um, look, guys, a chat server. Uh, oh my god, and when I type something on one side, it shows up on the other. That's miraculous. All right, so this is a demo that ships with Tornado. I just want to make sure that we understand what we're trying to implement. Um, so if we, want to implement, if we want to implement this with a thread per connection, it would look a little bit like this. Um, we'd start reading in the middle here. Uh, you create a listening socket, and then you go into the accept loop. And wherever you call accept, you block until some new client arrives. Uh, create a thread and start it. And then the main thread resumes uh, blocking on accept. And the handler thread gets a reference to the client connection. And then it waits for something to happen, um, like a new chat message to arrive from somewhere else in the world. And when that happens, this thread becomes unblocked. And it can write that message out to the waiting client and close the client connection. So this would be the simple thread per connection long polling server. Uh, oh, and an interesting question is, so where is the state being stored? Uh, in between starting to block on wait for event and resuming because it's completed. Like how do we, how do we, know, how do we know what self is? After we get back. It's in the stack. It's in the stack. Um, and how do we know that this is our stack rather than some other thread stack? We have a stack pointer that the OS uh, saves and restores in between switches. Um, and the final question is, how do we know that this is the next line we want to execute and not some other line? The, the instruction pointer, right, good, or the program counter. Um, so these three things are what the operating system and the language manage for you so that you don't have to remember what those things are called and your threads just work. Um, we're going to see that we have to basically simulate all of these things when we go async. So this would be a tornado example of a long polling chat server. So uh, there's a lot of tornado infrastructure that I'm not showing you here. Um, basically, if you want to be able to respond to requests, you instantiate a request handler. Um, and if you want to serve HTTP GET requests, then you call your method GET. And uh, in this case, all it does is it grabs a reference to on event. This is going to be the callback. And it adds it to a set called listeners. And then it returns none, right? It doesn't actually do any work. It doesn't respond to the client. So we decorate this thing with web asynchronous. And that doesn't do anything. It just tells Tornado, this method is going to return before the request to the, from the client is satisfied. So don't close the client's connection. Leave it open and let me uh, explicitly close it when I'm ready. So sometime later, some event comes from the outside world. And our callback gets executed with a message, at which point we write it to the client. And then we call self.finish, uh, and then we remove ourselves from the list of callbacks. Clear? Um, oh, so the stack, which before was implicit, now the stack doesn't help us because we lose our stack when get exits. So if we needed to store something somewhere here to remember, we'd have to store it on self. 
So the request handler becomes like the stack. It's the place where you store state for later. And we know that we are going to use this request handler's state instead of some other request handler's state uh, because of self. In Python, um, self is always passed around explicitly. Um, it's, it's like this. Uh, and so that becomes like the stack pointer. We know that this is our state and not somebody else's state. And finally, what is the instruction pointer in this example? How do we know what to do next when we get resumed? It's the callback, I heard some people say. Right. Um, when you want to uh, figure out what you're going to do when you're resumed by the scheduler after a yield, you register a callback. And that callback is executed by the scheduler. And that tells you what to do next. So it's all manual. This is what makes async hard. So let's look. When you type something in the chat window and you press Enter, what happens? JavaScript posts something to the server. And that's over here. This is the new message handler. Uh, it receives the post. It gets the contents of the message. It iterates over everybody who's scheduled or who has registered for event notifications, and it calls them. Right? Very simple. Um, and finally, we need to tie this together uh, into an application which can route requests by URL. And that is as straightforward as you want it to be. Um, there's a URL that goes to the wait for messages handler. There's one for new messages. And then there's some home page handler that I'm not going to show the details of, which has you know, the JavaScript. Um, once we've set up this application, we tell it to listen on port 80. And then we have to start something called the IO loop, which is provided by Tornado. Uh, we're going to get to this, and we're going to look at the source code for start in a minute. But first, let's take a look at what this app.listen does. So deep within the guts of Tornado is a TCP server. And it looks a lot like our multi-threaded example. It creates a socket, tells it to bind to a port. Um, it, sets, it calls set blocking zero, which makes it non-blocking, which means that no operation on it will cause the current thread to get unscheduled. Uh, but it makes the socket eligible to be um, passed into a system call like epoll or kq, um, so we can register for events on the socket. And we'll actually look at that code in a second. But for the moment, this is the heart. This is what makes an asynchronous framework non-blocking. All of the sockets are non-blocking. So then we grab the uh, file descriptor for the socket. And we call add handler, which we're going to look at in a minute. But all add handler does in terms of semantics is you pass in a file descriptor and a callback and a uh, mask of kinds of events that you're interested in. In this case, we want to know if the uh, file descriptor becomes eligible for reading. Um, and we say, call this function when that happens. So we tell the IO loop to manage that for us, and then we're done. So listen actually returns instantly, because it doesn't do any work. It just asks to be notified of some event later. When that happens, accept, accept handler is called by the loop with the original file descriptor of the socket. So we, uh, we know that the socket is ready for an accept call, because we know that this function is only called when a client is incoming. Um, there's a lot of exception handling and details that have stripped out of here, but that's sort of the gist. Uh, Socket.accept, something could go wrong, and it could raise an exception immediately. More likely, we've been 
called because there's a client, and so the accept call will succeed and give us a connection to the client. But either way, we're not blocking here. Um, once that happens, we can call another callback handle connection, which will start reading from the socket, parse the URL, route it, instantiate a request handler. Um, we're not going to go into that because that's the same as for any you know, web application framework. Um, this is the important stuff. So how does ioloop.add handler work? Uh, essentially, it works by magic. I'm hiding most of, you, you couldn't look at this slide and go off and write something. Neither could I. Uh, because it's all, first we have to remember who the handler was and store that in a hash table mapping from file descriptor to handler. And then we just call self.impl register. And we say we're registering on this, we're registering for notifications on this file descriptor with uh, this event mask. Um, in the case of listen, we want to know when this is readable. And then impl is something that Tornado chose when it started up. It might have wrapped uh, epol on Linux or kq on BSD or Mac OS. Um, it's some system call for doing async IO, where you have a list of file descriptors and you can ask for notifications on those file descriptors. And that's what start does. So remember, uh, ioloop.start is the final uh, thing, the last line in our main function. This actually gets events going. And start is as simple as you would hope it to be. It's an infinite loop. Uh, it asks the underlying system for events. And when they happen, it looks up the callback by the file descriptor and executes it. Uh, it does this for any event that has happened since the last time it called poll. And when it's done doing that, it calls poll again. This is the only blocking call in the entire framework, poll. Uh, in reality, uh, Tornado actually passes a timeout to poll, but um, it does actually sleep here. It blocks waiting for something to happen. Um, this means that Tornado doesn't spin in a tight loop and use all your CPU when nothing's happening. And uh, it also means that there can only be one event loop in the system, one event loop per process. Because uh, while we're blocked here, no other work is happening. It also means, well, and we'll get into the, the, the rest of the deep implications in a minute. Um, all right, so what does running the callback entail? Well, we saw earlier in the TCP server that uh, the callback we passed was self.accept handler. So that's what gets executed when the IO loop detects an event on a file descriptor. Is In this case, it's saying, oh, that file descriptor you sent me, which was the listening socket, was ready for reading. So we're going to call accept handler, um, and that'll do some work and start uh, parsing out a client request. So let's say that that client request was the JavaScript initiated a long poll. So it's starting a get request on wait for messages. Um, which was over here. So TCP server executes this callback, get. Um, after it sets up the request handler and passes it the client connection and so on, um, we're here. And, uh, and that's actually, that's the bulk of the talk. Um, we're already starting to get into bonus rounds. Um, the bulk of the talk is what you just saw. There's a I.O. loop. It, any file uh, descriptor in the system that you're interested in events on eventually gets registered with that loop, and it gets associated with a callback, and the callback is run when it's ready to proceed because there's been some event on its file descriptor. Um, 
And you'll notice that no threads were harmed in the making of this loop. This is all single-threaded. And this is characteristic of Tornado and Node um, and a lot of other sort of classical uh, asynchronous frameworks is that they can be concurrent without being multi-threaded because they're always only doing um, work on I.O. that's ready to take the next step. It's a little bit harder, but it's way cheaper because in order to <coughs> wait, in order to hold this connection open and be ready to send it messages, all we had to do is instantiate one of these uh, Python class instances and stick it in a set. We didn't have to keep a thread running in order to be ready to respond to the client when something that the client is interested in has happened on the server. Uh, so this is pretty much what I just said. So I won't um, dwell on it. So uh, two bonus rounds now. And um, how am I doing for time? OK, great. Uh, questions so far before we get into the bonus rounds? Yeah. So file descriptor, what kind of, so an obvious one is a web request. What other kinds of things would you expect it to be useful for? As far as I that you said it wouldn't be useful for a file type operation. So file. yeah, it is surprising. Um, so the main other thing that it could be is, is just a Unix domain socket, um, which for some sort of exotic setups, um, you might want to do async IO over. Uh, mainly it's for TCP sockets. Um, my, I'm not an expert on the state of the world when it comes to async file IO, but it's my impression that uh, Node and LibUV and those guys who are the real experts on this have had to resort to multi-threading under the hood in order to get async file I.O. And I think that's because the operating systems in their implementations of ePoll and KQ uh, emphasized the kind of I.O. that is slow and massively concurrent, and that is I.O. over the internet or over some network. Um, and file I.O. is not yet compatible with KQ or EPOL. Um, I don't, I don't, nobody's jumping up to correct me, so we'll call that the truth for right now. Okay, cool. Um, I might like to be introduced to them at some point. Yeah, other questions? Okay, we'll um, go forth. So the two bonus rounds. Um, the first thing is, now that you get the gist of using callbacks with async, uh, we're going to look at the cardinal sin that I see everybody commit when they first start using Tornado, but it's probably true for all other async frameworks. Um, and then we're going to look at how do you achieve roughly the same efficiency, um, but you don't have to use callbacks anymore. So, uh, here's our handler again. Um, let's just say for the sake of argument that before you write this message out to the waiting client, that you just want to pause for 10 seconds. So you want to write an asynchronous web server that will forward chat messages 10 seconds after they've been posted. Um, how would you go about that? I see that I'm, I subscribe to the Tornado mailing list. I see this twice a week. Um, why is this terrible? Nothing else happens. Nothing else happens, right? Because the, so on event, who's calling on event? The event loop is the ultimate caller of on event. So, so the loop, it's somewhere in here, right? It's called poll 
some thing happened in the network which caused it to execute a callback, and that callback called time.sleep10. And so this doesn't return for 10 seconds. And so we don't get back to poll for 10 seconds. And so all events that are occurring are queuing up in the operating system while we're waiting to uh, call poll again. We will be notified. We won't typically drop events um, unless, you know, they're so massive that they overrun the queue. Um, but your website is down, essentially, uh, until that sleep is complete. What you need to be able to do is say, dear event loop, I know that you told me something, and I'm going to deal with it in 10 seconds, so I want to yield back to you and let you do work, and then you tell me when 10 seconds is up. Um, and that looks like this. So we receive the message. We get the global I.O. loop, and then we call add timeout on the loop. And we give it the current time plus 10, and we register a callback, and we tell the loop, you can go do work, add this callback to your list of timeouts that are pending, and when that timeout is up, you execute me, and then I'll pop down here and finish my work. And uh, there's a couple of things to learn from this example. One is what I was talking about earlier about saving state. So because the stack can't help you here, because you'll be in a different stack by the time you resume, you need to save your state on the request handler. So you do self.message equals message, and then you can come find it when you're resumed. Um, the other thing is, if time passes and you haven't registered a callback, you're blocking the loop. So you can just look at code and know whether it's blocking or non-blocking. This is what I see all the time when people are uh, asking questions on the mailing list is, I read that Tornado is a non-blocking or an asynchronous framework. So is this code non-blocking? Is this code non-blocking? And it's easy to tell. If time passes and you haven't registered a callback, so if you call some function that does work and then returns the result rather than passing the result to a callback, you're blocking the loop. In order to leave, uh, in order to spend time without blocking the loop, you have to register a callback. Um, the third thing we can learn from this is that uh, callbacks are kind of awful uh, in terms of actually programming, right? We lose the stack. There's all of this syntax. Uh, this is the beginning of what's known as callback hell. And can you imagine if you had to like say, if x equals 1, then wait for 10 seconds. Otherwise, don't wait at all. So you'd have to get to on timeout by two paths. Or what if you were doing a loop over I.O. where you would um, you know, do some I.O., call a callback, do more, oh, I found the end, doing any sort of complex control flow with callbacks is awful because programming languages are designed to do control flow using things like stacks and instruction pointers. And since you've lost all of those facilities, you have to reconstruct them with callbacks and it's terrible. Um, all right, I, I need to jump back and just repeat this point. This blocks. Any questions? You can't use Tornado with MySQL. There is no non-blocking driver. I'm sorry. There is one for MongoDB. I wrote it. All right. If it didn't block, how would you know? Because you'd have registered a callback, which would be executed with the result of the query. Great. People do this. Like This is a very popular and totally awful uh, so, the argument I was making, though, is that callbacks are hard to program with, and there's a better way. Uh, and it looks like this. Um, so this came out about a year and a half ago in Tornado. Uh, ben Darnell, who is Tornado's maintainer, released a module called Gen. And Gen comes with a couple of cool things. 
One is the coroutine decorator. And, okay, so first of all, a, uh, and I'm going too fast now. I've given several 45-minute talks on just parts of this. So this is deep. But you should know that this is possible and something you might want to learn. Python has things called generators, which contain the yield keyword. And everywhere that they call yield, the state is stored. So all the local variables, what instruction they were going to execute next is stored, and the generator is paused. And then some outside force can resume the generator, and it will pick up where it left off. And the outside force can even send in a value. So the generator can pause and wait for something to come in and then resume and do more work. Um, that's built into Python. Tornado shipped something called coroutine, which builds on generators to make uh, asynchronous coroutines, which um, ask for work to be done and are resumed when that work is complete. So uh, you can create a callback, pass it somewhere, and then uh, wait for it and be resumed but you're still in the same function. So you haven't lost state. Your stack is still here, but it was cheaper than a thread. And you can do the same with a timeout by yielding this thing called a task. And when the task finishes, then you're still in the same context, but it's 10 seconds later, and you didn't block the loop. So you no longer have to save the message on self and then go find it again, because it's just a local variable and you still have access to it. Um, Twisted has something similar called inline callbacks. Uh, Python 3.4 is standardizing this, um, and this will be part of the Python standard library by the end of the year. Um, right now, that work is being done in a side project of Guido Van Rossum's called Tulip. I contributed. Um, a Q implementation for coroutines to that. Uh, oh, and V8. Um, the, uh, so uh, the, um, s what, what's the uh, Mozilla JavaScript interpreter called? Spider right, Spider Monkey has generators that look exactly like this, um, all the way down to the yield syntax. Um, they're part of the ECMAScript 6 standard, and V8 got them last month in their Google code or whatever their repository is. Um, and so Node is building this infrastructure around JavaScript generators as well, and it ends up looking pretty much the same. Um, you yield promises, and when the promises are resolved, your generator is resumed. Um, Oh, that's actually all I needed to say. Uh, so I can say a little more. This is a really exciting time for asynchronous coroutines. Um, everybody's kind of converging on it. It had gone from being something with competing implementations in various Python libraries to being something that's going into Python core. Uh, it's Going to, there's going to be competing implementations around Node, but they're going to be really good. Um, maybe someday it will be in Node core, but I know that they're kind of, that's always controversial. Um, but I increasingly think that this style of programming is going to be how async looks, probably starting this year. Uh, now that you know how the event loop works and you know what callback programming looks like, um, you're ready to learn this. You're ready to look at how this works and start using it. And it's almost as easy as uh, multi-threaded programming, but it has virtually the same efficiency as callback-based programming because you don't have a whole thread stack. All you have is this coroutine's local variables. And in some ways, it's even easier than multi-threaded programming because uh, you don't need to lock anything, right? Like, oh my god, what if, uh, what if listeners.add isn't thread safe? What if I would be crashed if I were interrupted there? Or what if I couldn't write a message without locking around a socket or something? 
that's not a problem with a coroutine because you know exactly when you're going to be interrupted. Uh, it's wherever you call yield. In between yield statements, the state doesn't change. You are the only protagonist. And then when you are resumed after a yield, you have no idea what the world looks like and you have to go look at it again. Um, so the presumption here is that you're always in a critical section unless you explicitly yield to the scheduler. Whereas in multi-threaded programming, the presumption is that you could be interrupted at any time and you have to explicitly lock in order to create a critical section. This is a lot easier. And it turns out uh, that for I.O. bound applications, which are most of the kinds of applications we're writing, um, free threaded uh, uh, preemptive multitasking isn't all that useful. Um, it's a lot more useful to say explicitly, I know this is going to take some time, so I'm going to yield here, and then the rest of the time, I'm going so fast that it doesn't matter, just let me do my work. So that's all I have to say. Um, time, am I still, do I have time for questions? Um, if people want to stay around, we actually just ran a little bit over. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so I'll start packing up, but I'll be like right there, uh, come over and ask me questions. And um, if you want to talk about MongoDB, go to the room right upstairs at 7 p.m. Thank you very much.